Hello, everybody. Uh, I am Ashutosh Datta from Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab in Laurel, Maryland. Uh, I also serve as the chair for uh, ACM Baltimore chapter, which is still kind of pretty young. Um, but I just heard that it used to be ACM Baltimore chapter some, some years back and then got discontinued. So at least we have a history. <laughs> um, so I know this is a, a seminar open to the world, so there are people uh, from around the world, uh, some people maybe just waking up, uh, some people just finishing their lunch maybe, and some people maybe asleep, but this is also being recorded. So we, this is the sixth, uh, sixth seminar, um, this is me. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues, uh, XCOM members, uh, Jeffrey Chavis, Vice Chair, SEM Chapter, uh, Random Gwyn, uh, who's the webmaster, Tamim Sakur, secretary, uh, Ken Smith, membership development chair, and Walak in Pelu, uh, who is here today in the audience. So we are um, speaking from uh, Building 201, Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Laurel. There is a website there, baltimore.acm.org. Uh, if you have missed any of the past meetings, uh, recordings, uh, you should be able to get there uh, and see all those. These are all archived in SEM YouTube. Uh, for those on site, uh, this is uh, Wi-Fi information. Now we also have put the information on each of the tables. So if you need to get access to Wi-Fi, we have arranged it for you. Uh, so at the outset, I also like to thank uh, my AV staff colleagues, Mitch and David, Kristen Kreider, uh, Jenny, and other AV folks who have helped us in the past. Uh, we also have additional volunteers, uh, Temur Hamid, uh, right here, and others who have helped to make this happen uh, uh, for the last few seminars. This is the agenda. Uh, we are in the first, uh, I know last time there was a suggestion about having a virtual networking. Uh, we have not been able to do that. Um, we try our best to do it next time. Uh, so while we do the physical networking or in-person networking, uh, we need to have some way so that people can chat. And obviously there are food and stuff that we cannot provide uh, to virtual attendees. So we have two invited talks. Uh, the first one is Professor John Barras uh, from University of Maryland College Park. Uh, he'll be speaking on next generation hybrid networks and their management. Um, I, We'll introduce him a little later, but I know Professor Baras for almost 15 years. Uh, he have also collaborated in uh, many research projects when I was at Belcour. Um, then we'll have a little break. Uh, then the second talk will be by Professor Sumit Roy uh, from University of Washington in Seattle. He also was the project lead um, on OUSD R&D uh, uh, briefly for about three years. Uh, he'll be talking about automotive brand and networks. Uh, at the second talk, and he'll be virtual. Professor Baras is uh, in person today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, several other sections, like IEEE Baltimore section, North Jersey, uh, Princeton Central Jersey, and New Jersey Coast sections, uh, who have uh, agreed to technically co-sponsor, so they were kind enough to send it out to their members. Um, I'd like to acknowledge them. So these are our two speakers, um, Professor Baras and uh, Professor Roy. Uh, you will uh, get a chance to ask questions after the talks are over. Each talk is about 45 minutes to an hour with Q&A. Um, before I get to the actual talk, uh, for some of you may have missed just uh, some glimpses of uh, Baltimore chapter. So February 24, this is actually 2022. Uh, we had the initial kickoff uh, of ACM Baltimore chapter reincarnation, I should say. Uh, so we had the opportunity of having the SEM president, Dr. Ralph Samuel, director of APL, uh, Professor Len Kleinrock, Dr. April Rickson, and Professor Henning Schulzerin from Columbia. So they, uh, and these are all available uh, in the YouTube. Uh, then the next one we had on April 20th, we have been usually doing once in two months with two speakers. Um, this is Professor Stephen Velobin from Columbia, and Dr. Anupam Josie from uh, UMBC, uh, Baltimore County. Then we had uh, three speakers uh, on August 11th, uh, Professor Raj Jain from uh, Washington University, 
Al Greenberg uh, from Uber and Milin Chabi as well from Uber. And followed by uh, one on October 18th, um, Gabriel Waters from Morgan State and uh, Amin uh, from NVIDIA. Then uh, the last one, some of you attended February 13th, is the first one in 2023. Uh, Dr. Misha Dollar from uh, Addiction, I used to be a uh, professor in, uh, in London, then uh, Dr. Kumar Bijay Mishra, uh, US Army Research Lab. These are some of the glimpses, uh, if you have missed, uh, at least just to give you an idea. Uh, that's our Dr. Rob Samel, our director of APL. He gave the inaugural talk. Um, Henning Children and Jeff Chabis, who is not here today. Um, he was on there as well, an April addiction. Uh, <clears throat> this is um, uh, Dr. Gabriel. Uh, he's, he's our president of ACM. So he was also kind enough to send a recorded video at that point. And you can see Len Kleinrock over there. He was speaking uh, from UCLA. And in his uh, backdrop, you see that um, in interface message processor IMP that he used to send the first packet from UCLA to SRI. And um, you should listen to that, uh, the history of internet, how it evolved. Um, that's a very fascinating one. Um, this is the August 11th one. Uh, I can see we have a lot of uh, youngsters, uh, undergrads also participate. We are still doing in a hybrid mode, so having a lot of in-person attendees sometimes is a challenge, but uh, at least I'm happy a lot of people from around the world can join. Uh, this is the one for October 18th, as you can see, um, you know, some of the attendees and speakers. Um, this is the one for February 13th, uh, so Misha Dollar from Ericsson and um, Dr. Kumar Bijay Mishra from Army Research Lab. Um, all these recordings, thanks to ACM staff, uh, we and thanks to staff at APL, we do uh, record them, we segment them, we send it out to uh, ACM staff, and they put them up in ACM YouTube. So if, if you look for, I mean, these are the links, but if you look for ACM uh, Baltimore chapter, you can you can see them there. So with that, um, I we should start our next talk. And uh, this invited talk, uh, Next Generation Hybrid Networks and Their Management, by Professor John Barras. Um, he's with Hybrid Network Center, University of Maryland College Park. And I'll just uh, introduce him briefly. Uh, you can read his bio, but um, he's a distinguished university professor, also Lockheed Martin Chair in Systems Engineering. And he has joint appointment with uh, Institute for Systems Research and EC Department at um, UMD College Park. He got his PhD in Applied Math at Harvard University in 1973. Since then, he has been with the University of Maryland, 85 to 91. He was the founding director of ISR. Uh, since 92, he has been the director of Maryland Center for Hybrid Networks, HiNet, and which he actually co-founded. Uh, he's also a fellow of IEEE, uh, Shyam, um, AAAS, NAI, um, IAPC, AMS, and obviously AIAA, and that's very interesting. Um, so Professor Baras, uh, there is a space building is right here um, in front of this building. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of folks from AIAA who are members of that. Um, then uh, he's also a member of National Academy of Inventors and a foreign member of Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. He has many major honors and awards that include 1980 George Axelby Award from IEEE Control Society, 2006 Leonard Abraham Prize from IEEE Communication Society, uh, 2017 Simon Ramon Medal and uh, ASCC Richard Bellman Control Heritage Award, uh, and 2018 uh, AIA Aerospace Communication Award. 2016 he was inducted in the University of Maryland uh, Clark School of Engineering Innovation Hall of Fame. If you visit uh, the campus anytime. Um, two of my kids, they are actually students there. Um, I had the opportunity to visit that, <laughs> one of their graduation, so you can see his picture there. In 2018, uh, he was awarded a doctorate honors um, by his alma mater, National Technical University of Athens, Greece. So with that, 
I will uh, request Professor Baras uh, to spend 45 to minutes, one hour. Um, you know, uh, thank you. Let's uh, welcome Professor Baras. Thank you, Ashutosh, and everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be here. It's a pleasure. It's amazing what uh, you've done in a year with, with this uh, ACM chapter. Hey, and uh, I'm happy to be here and talk to you about what we're trying to do at uh, Maryland with uh, various companies and other government labs in looking at uh, the next generation of hybrid networks. Okay, so hybrid networks means terrestrial networks, which are uh, wireline, wireless, but uh, the hybrid means we're also bringing drones and satellites. And in the talk, I'll try to, to justify why we're looking at that and also give you some of the difficult problems you have to, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, develop some of the modern network management techniques that primarily have become mostly virtualizing everything to the wireless and then even more difficult to drones and satellites, okay? So uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Let me see if this works. And then uh, I cannot point with this, right? Yeah. No, I can, I can. But to point, I point here or there. Oh, just to the laser? <laughs> yeah. There, there is a laser, but that's okay. I, I can, that's okay. So uh, uh, obviously, uh, being at the university, uh, most of the hard work is done by brilliant students, and I had several of them here, and some of the postdocs that work with me. Um, uh, there is a typo there. Dr. Krisha Bavayani is in the University of Amsterdam, and instead of a big O, there should be a U. Uh, that's my that my mistake. And also, we work with a lot of companies lately. A lot of this work in the later part, which has to do with beaming and all that, is uh, with uh, collaborators from NEC up in New Jersey. And these were some of the, uh, the, the sponsors we had. And as you can see, they are both from government labs and agencies, also from companies. And currently what we're trying to do in Maryland, try to, um, to create a consortium around this whole area with companies, government, and we also have international collaboration, both with the Technical University of Munich, where I'm also visiting senior research scientists, and also with the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, where I'm also visiting senior visiting research scientists in both places since 2013. And this gives us a very good um, view about what's happening in the world in terms of 5G, 6G, and some of the other technologies, okay? Okay, so um, there are a lot of uh, things that have uh, happened in the, in the last uh, 10 years, let's say networking, in terms of um, the explosion in the need for broadband and so on and so forth. And, uh, and this keep going. And uh, you can claim that this, a lot of that is for, for gaming and all that stuff, but there are also a lot of useful broadband uses. And the problem is that, uh, and we were actually at a forum, uh, it so happened last Tuesday in Fairfax, where we, with several other leaders from industry and government, uh, we talked about what is going to happen with 5G and 6G. And everybody sort of agreed that more or less 5G has not uh, fulfilled the promise of, of several years ago. There are many reasons for that. And, uh, and right now, uh, what we are trying to do with industry and also happens internationally, because we need to satisfy these um, very strict delay requirements. Uh, and we learned in a workshop organized in Dachstuhl in Germany several years ago that there's something called time sensitive networking. And the industry told us plain and square that uh, this is working, it gives us very fast uh, uh, delay. And we're not going to change it just because you say it has to be 5G. So what basically told us, and this is working in various groups in, 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 in Europe and here, uh, you have to show how 5G and 6G are going to play with this, right? Because this is working and it gives us satisfactory extreme delay requirements, which 5G cannot do. Okay, so that's a difficult problem. And I'll mention something uh, because it involves a very careful uh, uh, clock synchronization for TSM, down to nanoseconds, okay, which is possible, but it's kind of difficult. And now we have the, the methods for that, not developed by us, by others, but it's good that we have it here. 
So why area platforms? Because area platforms have various benefits that you all know. I mean, for instance, I can use them for UAV-aided uh, coverage. I can uh, use them as relays to improve the bandwidth. I can do various applications for this, like in, uh, in agriculture, healthcare, and so on and so forth. And um, you have, of course, disadvantages, but you also have uh, challenges because you have to be careful how many UAVs you bring, how long you keep them there, because you're trying to avoid congestion on the ground and everybody finds a better uh, path in the UAV and everybody goes there, you haven't solved the problem. So you have to be careful how many you bring, how do you do the allocation of capacity and so on and so forth. I'll talk a little bit about that. And then you have satellites, okay? Uh, uh, three years ago, I gave a talk at the satellite conference, which is a huge conference every, every year in, around March in Washington. And I, I, I talked a little bit about this uh, uh, tremendous importance for satellites to be as a backbone, if you like, both in terms of geos and leos for terrestrial wireless and how can this actually play very well for various things you see there, right? In terms of uh, carrying the traffic, helping to fill the, the gaps and so on and so forth. One of the things we are pursuing very intensively is to show, and you will see some actual measurements at the end, to show that if you combine uh, broadband satellites, uh, both GEO and LEO, with uh, uh, terrestrial wireless, you can actually offer to many more people broadband wireless at much lower prices, and you can establish it much faster. Okay? Uh, and this has to do with the various uh, new laws that happen and investments from the government that they don't have enough uh, you know, funds to provide the broadband that they proclaim and the requirements they, they ask for the entire country. I'm actually, it's almost a tenth of what you need, but by combining these, you can actually do it faster and cheaper. And the essence is to try to understand what applications and what uh, domains need the extreme requirements that have been written in the law, okay? And you'd be surprised that not not 100%, okay? But uh, I'll keep that at the end. Okay, you all know about the satellites, that they are geos and leos, and now we have uh, hundreds or thousands of satellites that they go on. Yeah, this actually is quite old. Now there are already several of them flying. And uh, you know that several companies, including Apple now, they can give you direct access to your uh, to your phone by satellites, not at the high bandwidth, but this is coming. So, uh, the, the, in addition to the military applications, which are obvious, there are many commercial applications, like I, 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 I list here. And the major one is we need to try to get at least 80 to 85 percent of the people in any part of the world to be able to have broadband. Uh, if we learn anything from the from the pandemic, is that. If you don't have broadband, you cannot do education, you cannot do healthcare, you cannot do manufacturing, many things. So, and that's extremely important. And it's also important to notice that many of the people that they don't have broadband access, they're actually in underdeveloped areas, in geographic areas, and so on and so forth, okay? And so that's extremely important. And these kind of combinations of uh, technologies, I think they help. So, uh, one of the things we try, we're trying to do is, of course, software-defined networks revolutionized optical networks. It's now standard in all switches. That means that I don't have to worry so much about the hardware. I can actually do everything for the control plane. And uh, so the question is, can you extend this technology and how to uh, broadband wireless and then to these hybrid networks, okay? Non-trivial because you have a lot of mo mobile parts, okay? So people, both in the military and Europe, they're putting actually cells or helicopters or UAVs and they move around to provide better connectivity and so on and so forth. And you can understand if you start moving cells with this kind of speed, how, what kind of different connectivity you have. And also you have thousands of satellites, so there are many interesting problems in scheduling and routing and all that. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. The other technology is network function virtualization. Actually, this happened first before SDN. And this says that if I have various algorithms, okay, think of it very simply, like I list some of them here, that they do functions for the network, and I have to virtualize them, and I can choose where I implement them in the hardware I have. The hardware is pretty much similar. So it's a combination of these two things, software-defined networks and local function virtualization, or NFV, that allowed the trade-off between optimality, if you want me to be very, very simple, in, uh, and they traded optimality with respect to speed of establishing networks, okay? So now you can establish networks extremely fast, which is very useful when you actually have to extend dynamic resource uh, to this kind of networks, all right? So 
one of the ways you can see what I'm talking about is trying to bring all this together. I want to bring together 5G, 6G, SDN, NV, satellites, drones, and all that stuff. We call this sort of convergence. And it sounds nice, but it has a lot of challenges about how to do it and how to do it so that you don't lose the advantages that each one of these technologies brings. And it also brings uh, new, because essentially now you're virtualizing the entire network, it brings new, uh, new, new challenges for security. Okay, And that was discussed also in the forum two days ago. So one of the, we, the people have thought about this and they call it, you know, basically SAGIN, which is basically space, air, ground, integrated networks. This is not our term, we just use it from other people. And, and the picture is, is meant to show you exactly what I described. You have terrestrial networks, which can be optics and uh, wireless, they can be 5G, 6G or whatever it's coming next. But you have also drones and you also have satellites uh, or any kind of satellites, okay? So um, the, the bottom line is what you see at the bottom, that basically the, we believe that these kind of hybrid networks, which are the next generation, they're not just um, interesting because they're interesting to study, they are the solution. If you, if you care about providing broadband to, to as many people as possible and also at an affordable cost, right? You cannot put, unfortunately, fiber everywhere, all right? So you have to, to, to do this kind of combination. Okay, so the, one of the, uh, the approach we have is actually to try, as I said, to, to combine these things. And one of the things we're trying to look at is, uh, you have, might have seen these diagrams, where you put different metrics and, and you try to understand the trade-offs with respect to this metric. So if I have one network and I'm trying to make these metrics as, as, as good as possible and good means be away from the, from the origin, and one of these diagrams for one particular configuration inside the other, then obviously this is inferior, okay? Not everything is so simple because these metrics actually fight each other. So that's one technique that you may want to, to think that we borrow from systems engineering and trade-off analysis here. So the, um, the uh, another uh, method, another, sorry, uh, concept that we try to borrow from this softwareization is the concept of network slicing. So simply put network slicing says, I can give you pretty fast dynamic networks, okay, to serve particular subset of your users with particular resource allocation suited to the application, okay? So here you see, for example, a pictorial that many people use that shows you that I may have a slicing for healthcare. I may have a slice for automobile cars and all that stuff. I can have another slicing for environmental monitoring, okay? The resources I'm using are the same, but I'm reallocating them. Okay, and this, of course, shows you that you can now have shareable, reallocatable resources, not just on the wireless, but on the entire thing. Okay, so this, for this to work, you have to be able to monitor the slicing with respect to the performance you can offer so that you can change it. One obvious advantage that people have, have thought about is if I am in trouble, let's say for security, I cannot change the resources and get to another part of the resources I have where I'm not having the security I have. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this. So here you can see uh, a resource allocation for mobile networks. If you look at the right-hand side, it shows you this concept where I can actually connect different resources through the slicing. If you wanna think a little bit more abstractly about the problem, uh, you can do the slicing on the core network. On the wireless side, if you wanna do end-to-end, -end, it has to be married very successfully with the, uh, if you like the RF allocation, the bandwidth allocation, okay? So it's this merger that, that you have to study very carefully and that includes like taking the users and their requirements, aggregating them. So when you go to the, uh, to the cell tower and then from there to the optical network, you can offer the requirement and then the SDN and NFV have to give you that. And then if you change, you change again, okay? So that's what this picture is trying to, to cover. And one of the, um, things that we will study very soon is in the next couple of slides is how do you think and you formulate this resource allocation in this hybrid network so that you can uh, you know solve them and, and, and satisfy some requirements and first we'll talk about this network slicing uh, for the core network which is uh, fiber and the wireless which let's say here is 5g and later on you can do 6g okay so um, Sorry for some of the equations. We basically have 
uh, the various unknown parameters like uh, the, 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 the users, the number of users you have for slice K, and then you have uh, the uh, whether a, a, a one slice covers a particular user, and then you have on the other side the pictorial which shows you how you're going to try to do this slicing and how you're going to pre-select if you like paths where you have predetermined so you can actually uh, get this effectively. And then you have basically this variable on the rest that co collects all this, uh, these variables that you have to allocate. The decision variables are the x's and the y's and the, and the k's there, and the k's correspond to the run, the, 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 the access network, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, all right, so you can actually try to then uh, combine this criteria. So you have this, uh, this problem that we, this is uh, the work of, uh, in the thesis of my uh, ex-student, Anus Egolami, who is now with Apple in California. And basically, you have two criteria here. And what you see there is an attempt to do trade-off by doing the so-called scalarization method. Basically, you combine the two criteria by some scalars weights, phi one and phi two, that typically sum up to one. And you can say you have the feasibility criterion on the first, which basically you have to say that all these x variables that are zero, one have to sum up to one. And then you have uh, the flow uh, constraints that you have to basically satisfy uh, whatever comes in and comes out, if you like. And then you have also the requirements uh, that you see over there. Then when you formulate this problem, and you have this litany of variables on the right hand side, which I hope you can read. Uh, you run into this problem that this problem becomes a mix in the Z programming problem. Okay, so many of these problems you will see that we, we run into this mix in the Z programming formulation, and you shouldn't be happy about that because most of the mix in the Z programming problems they are essentially NP complete. So uh, what we do, and it proved to be reasonably successful, is we uh, re relax them. We we take the zero one variables and make them in the interval zero to one, which is uh, the the the, the the most direct thing you can do. And then the problem is, okay, you will get a solution now because you don't have the so hard in this problem, but then you have to prove somehow bounds and performance, and that's where the difficulty is, okay? So you will see that here, all right? So uh, you have this metric that you want to minimize, okay? And you have actually more than one metrics combined over there. Okay, so you have, in addition, other requirements that have to do with the delay, which is very difficult on the top of this line. And then you have capacity constraints on the run that you have. And then you have additional uh, capacity constraints and feasibility. So I'm not expecting you to read all these variables. The point is that you can actually write that down. And there it's pretty reasonable. One thing that has emerged in the last year or so, this is model-based, okay? So model based doesn't quite cut it in some of these networks because of the complexity of the system. So you, what we're doing more recently is try to integrate these so-called model based approaches with data driven approaches, which essentially means in plain language, machine learning and AI. And we have very precise definitions, not just for machine learning, but also for AI. And that's a new challenge that a lot of people are trying to address. Uh, I was listening to a DARPA meeting about uh, three months ago and they call this the fourth wave of AI, okay? So, and what it means is that now we're trying to integrate the first wave of AI, which was rule-based, and the, the third wave, which was basically deep networks, okay? And that's very important because deep networks by themselves cannot reason, okay? So in our definition, when you want to talk about AI, you have to show that you add to the machine learning a, what is called a knowledge representation or reasoning component. And it doesn't take a very uh, difficult thought to imagine that this is the case, because think how you learn, okay? You don't learn because you take various concepts and you leave them standing in your brain, and then when you want to solve something, you, you do a search. That's not what makes you so effective. What makes you so effective is you build a knowledge base, which you keep uh, compacting, and you keep, them, you keep it as a conditioning when you want to learn more things. And that's why humans are so versatile, because they have been able to marry actually in the physical, in the same physical substrate, which is a mystery, both the machine learning or the learning and the knowledge representation reasoning. Tomorrow, if you want to listen, I think uh, uh, there is a link 
We have one of uh, three of Turing Award winners in the last uh, nine months that they made this point. Uh, Les Valian from Harvard is coming to Maryland to give a talk about exactly how to add knowledge to unsupervised learning. Uh, Lacan himself gave a talk last June uh, saying that if we're going to go from autonomy to intelligence, we have to add memory and knowledge. Okay, and Joseph Sifakis also gave a similar talk to Hong Kong about three months ago about the same topic. Okay, so this idea that we have to, to combine the reasoning of the rule-based or if you like extensions of the AI with machine learning is catching if we are going to actually be able to get rid of having to solve problems by adding, you know, GPUs and all that stuff. And, and, and the key idea is we have to put reasoning and representation. And this is extremely important here for networks, okay? Because the data you have are humongous. You cannot always use the data as raw. You have to be able to extract some knowledge and use it here. We haven't done that yet. I'm just telling you that what you see here is model-based. So the next version is going to try to link this to machine learning and so on and so forth. And how do you do that? A very simple idea is whenever you see an optimization, right, you may want to replace it with some simple form of a combination of neural networks and knowledge representation reasoning to help you, not to replace it, but to help you, okay? Um, all right. Okay, so this is what you see here. You have this uh, resource allocation mobile networks, and you can see that you have two time scales. One fast and one slow. Okay, so in the in the in the long time, you have the core network resource provisioning, and in the short time, the you have the run resource allocation and course less adaptation. Okay, so you have to tell me from the intermediate uh, users what do they need, try to aggregate it, and then pass it to the uh, to the long uh, time so that I can actually do the allocation, and that's what this graphic is trying to display. And there, there is a very detailed paper of that, which uh, you can find on my web page. On in the end, you will you will find my address, and if you need it, I can send it to you. Okay. And here is some of this uh, the computations that you see here, and we compare here uh, some of these methods where we uh, try to do this this relaxation and see how what happens in terms of uh, the the various uh, parameters and also what happens in the variation of the acceptance ratio of the, the demand, right? How many of the calls and the users that you need with the requirements you can actually service with this system and what do you gain by doing this sort of uh, adaptation and so on and so forth, okay? And you can see that in, in, in most of the cases, um, our scheme does better in terms of, in terms of allocation of resources, okay? So I can... You can see that if if you if you if you do the average acceptance ratio for the end user or the other things, right, and the slices, you see what what happens in terms of latency and the the, the CP latency, the, the the UP latency, and so on and so forth for the different things we compare. Okay, we compare the EMBB, the MMTC, and the, and the rule C slices. Okay, and uh, and these numerical results. Uh, have repeated in, in the same sort of situation for many other applications, okay? So then the next thing I want to study, or I want to, to, super, to, to, to tell you is, what happens if you go to microservices, okay? So if I go down and, uh, and, and, and do this uh, at that very uh, small level, then you have to um, try to understand the collaboration between the networks and the applications, okay? And uh, there are two paradigms here, okay? So what are you trying to do? You have an IoT, and they have very small computational capabilities. And you have the, 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 the cloud that has a lot of capabilities. So obviously you have to try to find some way to share the computational burden. And there are two ways you can th think of that. One is in terms of infrastructure provider and the other is from the applications point of view, okay? So the point here is how we combine the resources we have so that we can serve the end user, which in this case is gonna be some IoT device or application, okay? So, if you look at this, we have collaborative cloud edge local computation of loading, which is not a new concept in terms of sharing the, uh, the computation. So you can have mobile cloud uh, computing and mobile device computing functionally pushed to a remote cloud data center. And then you can have mobile edge com computing, MEC, computing resources in the close proximity of the subscribers. 
And then you can have collaborative cloud edge local computing. For instance, people have talked about moving various kinds of cores close to the user, right? If you think about a core and the peripheral network in 5G, you may have different cores distributed. So think about that this is the analog of what you do, for instance, for energy, right? Where you have microgrids and you collect them, you connect them together with a utility company to try to serve as many users as possible. It's quite analog to that. I'm trying to use this core so that I can actually quickly serve a local community, and then I can use the core network to connect these cores together so that I can actually get more users to get the service we want. The key thing that it comes through these methods is that when you try to satisfy the bandwidth and delay requirements, one thing you have to be careful is how deep you go into the network to satisfy the delay, because if you go too deep, then this is going to kill you. Okay, that's why we're looking at things like, you know, time sensitive networking and so on and so forth. So you can actually do some of the more demanding in terms of delay applications very close to the edge. Okay, and then collect the, the, the traffic there and then try to serve it from SDN and NV, right? And this makes it clear why you need two time scales, right? You need one fast in the local and one slower in, in, the, in, the, in the longer haul, okay? Right, so uh, here is a, a simple example. You have a, a portable device that does various kinds of things on the edges and you have to serve it with this so-called 5G slice, okay? So which means you have to combine some bandwidth allocation to this, which is time varying, as the, the, the allocation of resources is time varying, the traffic is time varying, and then you have to serve the collection of this demand by the core network, okay? So that calls immediately in collaborative cloud edge local computation. You're not gonna be able to do that just by the resources you have at the edge. If you try to do it by just the resources you have at the cloud, you're not gonna be able to satisfy the delay requirements. So it's quite clear. All right, so you have, uh, if, if we take the point of view of the, the INP perspective, then we have various options we have looked at, excuse me, we have single tasks, you can have a sequence of tasks, you can have graph tasks, okay, where there's causality between the nodes, and then we can actually shift from a monolithic service that has problems to this kind of microservice architecture where I try to combine these resources I have, okay? So why this is a difficult problem is because you have actually now uh, heterogeneous components. You have uh, generic dependencies between the components at different scales, and you have a non-component uh, behavior. It's here where you might want to use some, if you can get them, fast machine learning, all right? Because one of the problems we have with machine learning is that they are not fast to learn, okay? And the other thing that we have is that they require a lot of data. So in these kind of problems, I want to emphasize the fact that the machine learning problems you have to solve are very different, fundamentally different than the machine learning problems you have to solve when you look in phase recognition. Because in these dynamical systems, okay, you're never gonna get gazillions of trajectories on which you learn and use it, okay? So you have to exercise progressive learning. And again, this idea of having knowledge representation reason is very helpful, okay? So you have to start learning as quickly as you need it and learn as much as you can. What are you gonna do? You're not gonna say, let me run a simulation for one million types and then what if the simulation is not what you actually see in practice, okay? So it's a very different problem when we apply machine learning and AI to dynamical systems versus applying machine learning and AI to things like fingerprint recognition, phase recognition, and things like that, okay? It's th these dynamical problems require new things. Anyway, you formulate the problem, we have decision variables, again, you see zero, one, and we minimize these two metrics, okay? The, uh, the, the one, the, we have the mapping constraints, we tell us who, we, which we have to use. We have the capacity constraint, and you have the domain constraint, and then you have energy constraint, okay? Because we also care about how much energy we spend. These are all ma are mapped to variables that you have in the formulation problem. Again, warning, this is a model-based approach. And if you go to a real situation, you may find, because you cannot identify all these parameters correctly, okay? That they may not work very well. Again, that's another opportunity uh, that you can actually add machine learning to help you, okay? All right, so you can change the limit around to come to this problem. 
And so this becomes uh, two criteria which are combined. You can see obviously here that I'm combining the criteria with two variables, lambda, two weights, sorry, lambda, one minus lambda, because I want to go to this colorization method, which is standard for doing trade-off analysis, because I don't want to solve a lot of problems where I constrain one criteria, minimize the other, or maximize, because it's very expensive, okay? You lose something here, but after all, because you have multiple criteria, optimal doesn't make any sense, right? What you're looking for is trade-offs. So even if you lose some of the, if the, 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 the feasible curve is not convex, you're going to lose the non-convex part, but you don't care. You're the designer. You, you're looking for feasible solutions. The main thing is trade-off, not optimal, okay? If you have many criteria and many uh, constraints, they fight each other. So you use optimization rather as a tool for trade-off and not as to find the optimal. Okay, so you have this problem and you have the formulations we can try to solve it and again we get numerical things to solve it sorry and you get this kind of characteristics you can see here the application acceptance ratio compared with different methods so we use for instance cplex which is a standard industrial uh, now software for doing uh, nonlinear programming with constraints this was started by academics but it was bought by ibm all right and then ibm was smart enough to buy also e-log which was the best, it's a company that came from France that they had the most, uh, the stronger rule base, okay? And they came here because they couldn't find enough capital. They blossomed and, and then IBM bought them and they put together uh, the constraint-based reasoning that you get from, uh, from e-log with CPLEX. And guess what was the first application they applied to? Networks. When, when, when IBM created the IBM Optimization Studio where they integrated these things, the first application was networks. Why? Because it was networks that they had the millions of parameters and nodes, and they were very huge system, and you needed to actually do very careful system engineering, which is scalable, right? In many of these complex systems, the requirements can go to the hundreds of thousands. We were listening to a talk from, a beautiful talk from the Sikorsky group at Maryland about two weeks ago, and I, I really liked it because the person who was the chief engineer for a heavy lifting air, uh, uh, helicopter <laughs> they told us they had 137,000 requirements and 25,000 metrics. Okay, how, how can you do trade-offs with this if you don't have tools that allow you to divide and conquer and do the trade-offs and then compose things and all that stuff? That's what it's all about. So you have here in the bottom line, you have the application latency, okay? And in the, uh, in, the, in, in, the right, in, in the right bottom, you have the average energy. You can see, actually, the, 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 the orthogonal things that you see on the graph, so you get the tolerance of the mistakes. And then you can see on the, at the bottom different combinations of software we use to actually do these approximations when we relax and mix in the programming problems. Okay. All right. So if I go now to the, um, to the other side, looking at the application, then the problem here is how can an application optimize, optimize its resource usage, right, across multi, this multi-tier infrastructure we're talking about. Remember, here we're only talking about wireless and optical core, okay? We haven't gone yet to drones and satellites. This is coming later. Okay, so we have to discover the coupling between the different components, put this as a constraints, and again, try if we can to formulate it as a mixing this program problem, and then try to find a way to solve the relaxing and get some idea of bounds on performance. All right, so you have the key motivation here is that you have very varying, okay, computer usage. And if, you, if, I, if I push the slides here, you can see that you have very different requirements. Sorry, let me go back. Yeah, you see, you have many different requirements from the different applications you have different couplings so you have to actually adjust all these things to try to solve these problems and they become fairly complex constraints both in terms of the dependencies of the applications and also the traffic so you can have again the placement variables for assigning the function v to an infrastructure you have the resource allocation which are the y variables and then you have the coupling function between them okay which you may or may not know and, and that's again one area where you may want to try to learn these dependencies by actually measuring data. And if you go to the upper uh, thing, we have the requirements in terms of delay, throughput, and reliability. And in the bottom, we have the way this is supposed to be computed. Okay, so if you go from the left to the right, to, to the to the right, what happens is you take the demand from your wireless resources, you aggregate it, and then you try through the SDN and NLV to service it. Okay, 
And again, you see obviously that you have to work on two time scales and all that stuff. Okay. So um, to make our life simple, we hypothesize here a linear coupling constraints. Uh, if you can do the nonlinear, more power to you, but I mean, this was hard enough. And then again, in this, uh, Roma is the initial of resource orchestration and multi component applications, all right? R O M A. And that's our algorithm where it shows you the coupling here in the first equation on the, on, the, on the left. You have the capacity constraints, you have the feasibility, which says that the variables that they are zero, one have to sum to one, which means one at one point is one, and the others are not. You have the application performance. In with terms of lower bounds on delay, okay, and upper bounds on the bandwidth on the left hand side, and you have the domains. And then you here on the right hand side, you find you, we, we, we say that we're going to have a linear bound, if you like, on this uh, relationship between the, the, the various variables and resources. And sorry, let me go back. So So this is the, the numerical results we have in terms of the, um, uh, so here you see an application of a video sensor, phase detection, feature extractor, okay, the biomarker, and then the alert manager. On the other side, you see a camera, I have a video sensor, object detection, so on and so forth. So these are different applications that you now have to try to serve, and they come together. You have a service orchestration in the middle, and this is actually an experimental setup, which is simple enough, so you can actually, uh, you collect some data and try to to, to try uh, this uh, method on, an on a realistic problem. So here we compare uh, on the top, you have the accuracy and the CPU cores, the compute again and the, and the um, network uh, bandwidth if you like, and then the accuracy and the, and the same variables on the bottom. So you have the performance of uh, what list application and you basically compare this method that we have, which is adaptive and, and dynamic, with a static method. And on the bottom, we have, again, the same performance between the static and ROMA. And you can see that we're doing quite a bit better than the static performance. Not unexpected. The contribution here is that you actually have a formulation which is model-based that you can handle, okay? With the limitations, as I said many times, that the model-based assumes. And here you have the performance of object detection application and performance of object detection application, both in aroma versus static, it which refers to the two applications I refer to in, in this slide here. Okay? All right. So, so then this is an attempt to try to introduce learning in this business. And okay, so if you want to introduce learning and you want to do decision making, the standard thing is to do reinforcement learning. Right? or in short RL. So that means you have to actually go into your resource allocation problem and try to introduce artificially some, some, some weight, some gain that you want to learn. And that is a, 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 an artifact introduced by the designer and it's good only if it gives you good algorithms, right? Nobody's gonna give you a reward because you learn anything. This is an artifact, the same way we introduce metrics and constraints to, add this, to satisfy the specification. So essentially, whether it's good or bad is what it does as a, as a result, okay? So the point is that if you learn this reward function, as it's called, then this helps you to do a, a better decisions, okay? It's very well-known technique. It has a couple of problems, uh, reinforcement learning. The most serious one is that de facto from the beginning, brittle. So there's been a lot of work in the last years to try to make reinforcement learning robust. We have a lot of work in this area, which I will not mention today. We have been able to link this to risk and various uh, duality metrics in mathematics between risk and, and performance. And this has uh, enabled us through rigorous mathematics to actually recover, for instance, all the, uh, all the reinforcement learning that they are regular, regularized, okay? By the same sort of methodology. But here, I'm not gonna talk about this. So you have network bandwidth, usage and required for a person to say, this is connected, right, to um, things like, okay, in wireless networks, not only you don't know the demand, but you also don't know what you're offering. You don't know the quality of service that you're offering because of the variability of the wireless channel. So there are two areas where you can try to introduce reinforcement learning on any kind of machine learning method you want, you want to put. One is to try to estimate the demand or predict it, 
but you, whether, you have to do it fast enough so that your algorithm can serve it. And the other one, to estimate the quality of experience, as it's called now, that you're delivering. And these two actually can give you time varying constraints that you can put into this kind of algorithm if you want to enhance it by these data driven methods and not just go with model based because you know that this has limitations. Why? Because the models cannot be accurate for these complicated systems. So that's an attempt that we did for this. So you have the formulation here. I'm sorry. Okay, so you have certain resources that you have available. You have the amount of resources that uh, you have at an ODM. All right, and you can write them down and you have the action increase or decrease the allowed network computer resources or not change the computer network service. And here is the reward function that has this very simple expression that is DL if something is less than what you need or it's minus S otherwise. Okay, and you can give some simple expression of this reward function as I saw there, which involves the two values of, uh, of the variable P, which you can think of as a state. Okay, so SARSA is a well-known algorithm for RL. So with this structure of the reward function, we applied SARSA to this algorithm, to this problem, sorry. Oops. Yeah. And you can say the, the results of SARSA versus our method, which is ROMA. Okay, so the ROMA one is the green and the SARSA is the blue and the static is the black. Okay, so if you look at the computer core and the network, uh, Mega BPS, okay, you can see we're doing better because the green is either higher in terms of, of the bandwidth and the, uh, the computer is lower, okay? And on the other, on the bottom side, you see the, the detection score and again, you're doing comparably well, okay? So I, I am the first to tell you that we just scar uh, scratched the surface here. There's a lot more to be done in terms of trying to find out what reward functions work better, what arguments are faster and so on and so forth. But clearly, because of the complexity of the wireless channels and the, and the impossibility to have uh, accurate models, you've got to go that way. You cannot just, uh, you know, assume that you're going to solve everything by... Um, uh, so I have to speed up because I don't have a lot of time. Okay, so let's go now to area platforms, right? So this first part of the talk was basically, I'm trying to do this dynamic resource allocation between wireless, which may be 5G, and core, okay? So now we're going to introduce the, uh, the, the UAVs. Many people have studied that. But now you have to solve several problems. Where to place them? And when you place them to help the ground uh, traffic, now they have to be part of the network. So they have to also understand their routing protocols. So you have to essentially solve a joint problem of placing the UAVs and doing the routing. So that's the problem. And then you have, again, several criteria. You have the feasibility constraints on the top. You have the flow conservation constraints, what comes in and what comes out. You have the capacity constraints. You have the domain constraints. Okay, and you have the, uh, the mobility constraint. And then, uh, because several people suggested it, we added, let me go to the next slide. Yeah, we added an objective function about energy. Because when you put uh, the UAVs in, energy depends on how much they can be there, right? So it depends for how long they can fly. And, and now there are UAVs that they are all electrical. We have very short duration. There are others that they operate on gas, which are longer. And I have seen even examples of hybrid UAVs. And why hybrid? Because sometimes you want to, to use the UAV without making a lot of noise, like in the military. So then when you go near what you want to, to actually search, you go electric like you do with cars, and then you go hybrid for the longest distance, all right? But anyway, so you need to introduce some metric like we have here for the energy, okay? And then you have an onlinearity of the new objective function. You put it all together through the same uh, mathematics, if you like, that we've seen before, and you will end up again with a large um, mixing as a programming problem. Okay, so you can see here that you have the mixing as a linear programming, and you can relax it, as we said before, and then it becomes like minimizing this function on the left with these constraints, and the right hand side constraints, okay? And the relaxation is again, because it, it, when you have mixed integer program problems, the first thing you try to do is solve the integer problem uh, first, because it might be that this one helps you decompose based on the integer uh, programming structure to, to, to several problems. And then the continuous part, you can solve much easier and put it back together again. It doesn't happen very often, but it's, you should try it, okay? So here is a classic example of where we compare these relaxations. The, the, 
the fully connected network, the full linear program, uh, and then the linear programming approximation. And you can see uh, the differences by different coloring of where you actually put the UAVs and how much coverage they have. And one of the things you, you, can, you can notice is that the number of UAVs you put uh, it has to be determined because you're trying to make sure that you don't create a bottleneck on the traffic that goes to UAV because you haven't done anything. Actually, if you are, if you are not very careful and you put just one or two or you're very frugal, then you may create actually a bottleneck on the traffic between the UAV and then you cannot help the, the people that you're trying to help on the ground. Okay. All right. So uh, these are some of the, um, uh, let me go further down. So for that one, we put actually a learning scheme, which we call reliable edge learning. This is another word for federated learning, okay? For many of these networks, because of their size, you cannot afford to take the data and send them all to a to co to coordinator, okay? So what federated learning does is you have regions, and in that region, you learn whatever you can, and then you send the, the information you learn to the coordinator, which is much more efficient, okay? So here, we're trying to learn, you know, the edges in this network and what works, and there's a formulation for that in, in these papers, okay? And the, the key innovation here is we introduce trust, right? We introduce notions of trust to be able to, to quantify uh, what we're learning, okay? We have done a tremendous amount of work on, on trust, going over from, like with George Dracopoulos, using partially ordered semi-rings to, under, to understand dynamics of trust and mistrust, apply them to various protocols, even on the internet, okay? And what we're trying to capitalize on in the fact that it is known since the classical paper for Kenneth Arrow that if you're going to collaborate, you have to have some notion of trust, okay? So what trust means is not always trust between humans. Uh, in, in terms of trust between machines, it means that they behave as you expect them to, meaning that they satisfy their specifications and they are within their tolerances, right? So we have various notions of trust that we introduced to that and, and we used it. And basically here, the message that you send is whether a particular uh, node is benign or adversary. And you do that by using the information you get from your neighbors. That is an idea that has been used in computer science and we borrowed here to try to solve the problem of software hardware co-design when I have a multiprocessor and I'm trying to, ex to execute a distributed program and then some of my processors are faulty. What, what do I need in the network processor so that the algorithm proceeds, okay? So the idea there was I'm trying from the system calls another to, to understand which are faulty and then I exclude them from the computation. So we borrow this idea in terms of consensus and other algorithms and we have various notions of trust that we use here, okay? Let me, you have a local and global trust. There are papers, uh, many papers on this that we did with my student, Shania Liu, who now is Facebook, okay? and we use different notions of trust. And I think I like the, what we did because the trust part is a module. If you don't like our way of doing trust, you can put yours and they will work with the, with the routing algorithm or whatever other algorithm you're trying to ex exploit the trust to actually create some confidence. The, the key idea on all these algorithms is the following. When you find nodes or links that are untrustworthy, you kick them out. So what's your problem now is, do you have enough connectivity to be able to run the algorithm? So that's where you have to try to find conditions on the connectivity you need, okay? And also, the other, the other thing that you have to determine is how many bad nodes and links can you tolerate and still can do that, okay? So the algorithms are pretty simple. They're basically, you thin the algorithm, you thin the network by throwing out of the computation the, the, the nodes and links that they are not trustworthy, okay? All right, so I'll skip that. If you're interested, I can tell you more. I want to go to satellites a little bit. Come on. All right. So, yeah. So when you have satellites, you have to tell me how I go from the ground to the satellite. So you need a gateway, All right? So you have to do this joint gateway placement and routing. Before, you had to do the placement of the, of the drones and the routing, all right? So think of it now, I'm replacing the drone with a gateway because that's my gateway to the satellite. And you can do this for Leos or Geos. We have done a lot of work in this area. Again, you formulate the problem, all right? In terms of the criteria you have, you do the same scalarization method. You have the placement constraints, you have the capacity constraints and the flow constraints. Again, the placement constraints now is where you put in the gateway, okay? And then depending on whether you have a Leo satellite or a Geo satellite, 
you may have even a more complicated problem because if you have a LEO, now you have to show how things move from one satellite to the other. Well, for the geo, you don't have this problem, but you have other problems. You have more delay and other things. Okay. So you end up with the same problem. You, you try to normalize things to try to simplify the bit, uh, but you're not going to escape in the end. You're going to end up with a mixing as a programming problem again of the same type you've seen before. And then we have done this numerically to try to actually solve and try to find the average delay and so on and so forth. And you can see here for some typical networks we tried that basically the, this uh, surprising, this simple brute force relaxation to a linear program works pretty well. Okay. Uh, what's going on here mathematically, if you like to know, is that the larger the system is, the better this relaxation works. Okay. There's a little lemma in, uh, in an optimization book that I read many years ago and stuck in my mind that if you try to do this relaxation to a small, it won't work. If it's very large, somehow it works okay, okay. So uh, this, these are the results that we have in this. There are various curves, okay. And then now you have a controller placement in SDN enabled satellite networks, an analog problem where, where I'm trying to actually put a controller for the network, not just a gateway. And we have done this in by similar methods. Let me skip that. Okay. Okay, so I want to go to the last part, which has to do with uh, mostly with joint work we've done with NEC, where we're trying to go to things that are much more relevant for 6G. I'm trying to, to, to understand now, how do I do these multi-beams, okay? And you see here uh, the various scenarios that uh, we have considered. And, and this is important because if, if you see some of the things that they go to the 6G ThinkNet and some consortia about 6G, that this is the, the main advantage of 6G are two. The promise is that you're going to integrate communications with sensors. And for at least short distances, you're going to be able to have much more directivity in terms of your communications. And therefore, you'll be able to access users without having to worry about too much about interfering of the beams. OK, so this is a very nice paper that we did where basically we used composite beam forming ideas uh, to try to create this, these beams, which actually ended up being a coding problem. So you have the system model, like I, I saw here. That's, this is uh, from the PhD thesis of my student, uh, Ariman Tozabang, who is now at, uh, uh, he's in California, but then in the summer is going to Qualcomm for a test, and then with NEC, okay? And uh, you, can, you can see the formulation here in terms of what you, you, you uh, what are your observables and the noise, the hybrid beforming, okay? And we use this notion of, of uh, the, the big form, the, 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 the beam forming has to do with the, how do you, subdivide this circle so that you can actually allocate the beams. And you have this beam forming model, which you can see subdivides the circle to various regions, and you're going to have one beam for each region. And this became a, essentially a code book design problem or equivalent, which we've solved. Okay. And the idea here is that you have the various windows that you see at the bottom in the PSI domain, which is these variables that you see on the, on the, on the top, that they, that they basically take the angles and divide them. And in each one of them, you're going to have a beam. Okay, and uh, there is an uh, optimization problem which you can solve, and then you get these very um, complicated waveforms numerically, and then you can see both by uh, analytics and simulations that they do indeed give you many beams, and they are separated. Okay, all right. So, ah, okay. Let me finish. Um, Okay, so the, we're looking at extensions of this for intelligent reconfigurable services uh, and applications of that. You can see different scenarios that people are using. I, be, I, I follow uh, something at this headquarter in Bavaria in Germany, which is called 6G ThinkNet. And we, they have a meeting every three months. And you listen to these talks and roughly as you listen, you're thinking about half of it is science fiction, half of it is real, but half of it is real. And they are working on making these kind of applications real, okay? So I want to go to the last part. Yeah. So I told you that um, one of the things we are interested in is to show by experiments, simulations, and continuative analysis that combining satellites with terrestrial wireless is a cheaper and a more affordable solution to provide bandwidth for many. So what's the key idea is you, you have to understand for what applications you need the stringent delay requirements that they came to this law that the government passed and the funding that you need to do, okay? So 
together with huge network systems that they brought the problem to us, we started looking at various applications with the objective being, if you are a typical household and you want to use uh, bandwidth, how many of the applications or pieces of the application you run really need these very stringent requirements? And the answer is surprisingly, and these are examples that we did in an actual test bed. Several of my students work in an actual test bed at Houston Systems in, in Germantown, about 15%. Only 15% require this total delay, total stringent delay requirements, okay? And we did this by analyzing different applications, okay? You can see video conferencing, video streaming, okay? The only one that you cannot deal with is gaming. If you do interactive gaming, it's all real time, all right? But even if you're gonna use Netflix, when you're looking for a movie, fine, there you need a little bit faster response. But once the movie you play, you can actually even store it with your local computer and play by memory, which is standard. Let me close by saying a summary of what we're looking for. We're looking at these kind of problems that I mentioned, dynamic network slicing, security. One thing I don't mention is this thing you see down, security and trust in data plane programmability. The technology and the, has been now advanced to, I don't do only you know, the control plane, but I go to the, to, the, to the data plane, and there's a protocol that's called P4 that's being used for that, and the special hardware for that actually as you know, Nick McCune did the special hardware for that and the company was bought by Intel and that's how Intel got into some of the hardware for this. Uh, the management is a very big issue. That's what we concentrate with. The, we, we don't do a lot, at least in my group, a lot of hardware work. And then how do we good, do machine learning that's fast enough and scalable together with AI to, to improve these networks? And we we'll, we we'll look at uh, applications of that to autonomous cars. Actually, I'm gonna bring some little cars in Maryland, if they give me permission to run around like I see in the discovery lab of T-Mobile in, in Atlanta. And actually, if you, if you follow the news, Elon Musk actually is pushing the so-called robocars, right? Autonomous electric vehicles that they use as, uh, that they are as, uh, as taxis. Believe it or not, in 81, with a, my first student, who is actually here at APL, Alan Pugh, his PhD thesis was on dynamic, uh, management of fleets of cars that in that time they were autonomous of different sizes and it was for an airport. So you come out of a terminal, you call the car, can pick you up, leave you somewhere else. Of course, those days the autonomy meant that I have a wire in the asphalt and I follow the wire, there were no multi-lanes or anything like that. But some of these concepts now going to multi-lanes, we are trying to, to re-examine and prove them here. Uh, one of the issues here is whether you're gonna charge for that. And my point is that if you follow some studies people have done from a systems engineering perspective and total cost of ownership, going all the way to a study like that for the Bay Area uh, Metro, you have to give them free. And that's where I get in trouble, right? Because once you, you, you do that. Okay, so this is an attempt to pictorialize that as many people have said recently, the only way you're gonna make progress in the systems and understand them is thinking of the network, however heterogeneous it is and so on and so forth, as a system. We try to apply modern system engineering techniques to that, and that's what this is trying to, to depict. We're doing that. And we're actually, in this context, we're trying to integrate uh, machine learning and AI with this. And then we have a tremendous amount of work that we have done in what I call physical layer security scheme. And that's true physical layer, meaning uh, techniques that are based on properties of the chips, of the channel, of the hardware, and so on and so forth. And the key idea is we try to make the various components um, they're very secure, authenticated, in a way that you can almost not break it. We're using things from the trusted platform module. We, we have secure biometrics. We have all kinds of other things. We add a small energy, like uh, inspired by the specific emitter identification for the Department of Defense. Okay, so there's a lot of uh, work that we've done in this area. We try to see how much of that we can actually put. And last but not least is basically, we're trying to, to add these uh, formal methods and also AI and machine learning, but as you see in the next to last bullet, by trying to always not just talk about machine learning, but also talk about knowledge representation and reasoning. So that's all. I hope I didn't run too much over time. You have the slides, you know where I am, and you can contact me. There are questions on the web, and also we'll give a chance to um, have the audience ask the questions. Uh, anyone you want to go ahead, read that? 
the first question is from Amruthar. Uh, how can UAV and satellites support 5G when the delay by UAV and satellites are more than the required limits for 5G? <laughs> Very good question. First of all, if you have LEOs, the delay is shorter, but the answer is that's why we're looking at TSN. Okay, you have to control. Uh, you first to understand first what are the delay requirements, and, and if and if you can if you should not use the satellite, don't use it. You don't have to use satellite, right? But as I told you, in measurements we did, the stringent requirements that they are in the law, they only apply to about fifteen percent of the applications. For the rest of for the rest of them, you can use the satellite, especially the Leo one. Now, if you have very stringent delay requirements, five G won't cut it. You have to integrate five G with TSN. Uh, the next question is also from Ramuthar. Do you have experimental results of the use of UAVs? Does it satisfy 5G requirements? Sure. Yeah. Then after that, the next question is from Hal. The same, the same, the same answer, right? If you have a UAV, it has to become a part of the protocol. If it doesn't work, then you cannot use it. So that means you have to have bandwidth and delay requirements that are compatible with the with the, with the resources you're trying to use, right? And that you can analyze. One area where UAVs may be helpful, for instance, is when you try to enhance the so-called vehicle to infrastructure communications. And that has to be slow because the UAV will give you a picture of what's happening in the roads around you. Like in a famous example from Qualcomm, if I may use, you have a road like this and there's an accident here. You come this way, well, somebody from above have to give you because there's no way to see this. Okay. So if you don't have a, if you don't have something from above to tell you that, then you may run very quickly and hit the car. Okay. So it's it's in this area that yeah, we can help you. systems which is really fancy okay at that time but today I'm working a commercial company which I don't want to name okay I can feedback to you guys it's commoditized it's completely commoditized it was nothing DWDM okay the call backbone is so powerful it can provide infinite capacity okay this is a fact okay <clears throat> So when I was watching your presentation, I saw that your network slicing all these good things on the on the access, which is Wi-Fi, okay, which is radio. And uh, here I provide a vision for you guys that uh, it will be commoditized by commercial power, okay. So you can consider in the future access capacity is infinite. Because I'm at the same time I'm a physicist, and I can testify that you know capacity is really huge. Okay, somehow I think we didn't do it, do it right, such that we are still limited at the age that the capacity is at, uh, limited. And based on my experience back then in Bell Labs, the commercialization of DWDM to today commoditized, I see no reason. Absolutely no reason why the access capacity is limited. Okay, so, but however, there are certain areas that's indeed it will be limited. It's satellite to ground. It's not just capacity, it's delay also. Pardon me? It's not just capacity, it's delay. A delay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there will but, be but physical that's extremely limitations. important. If, you, if you're going to use any, any vehicle to vehicle infrastructure, or vehicle, to infra, vehicle to vehicle communication, or vehicle to infrastructure, it's not just bandwidth. The bandwidth may be small, and you're right. But how are you going to handle the delay? Yeah, OK. So my so that's why the, the, the new notion that has come in front is what's called deterministic networking, OK? They just get away from trying to handle the random all the time. And, and, and this started, actually, by the realization of commercial companies that they use TSM, and you can analyze it almost deterministically. And then the question is, how can I marry this with 5G? 5G is a technology that was created. Why? Because I want to do a lot of things to the cloud. Okay, so you, so okay, 
if I'm going to go from the cloud to, to, the, to the actual user, there's a discrepancy here. I have to, to see how I can do it. Okay. I, it doesn't matter if I have infinite capacity. The question is, can you handle the interface within the delay requirements you need? Yeah, that part I don't quite understand. But what yeah. I'm saying is that, you know, I see the capacity is not an issue in the future. Yes, there are certain limitations. Well, have you ever been, I, I, I have a student who's now with Facebook. Have you seen that terrible thing like that ever in your iPhone? You know what that means? What does it mean? What, if you see that, what does it mean? It means you're looking for capacity, right? So it depends on what, how many people are using the, band, the, 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 the resource uh, that you have. I've seen it. I've seen it home. Okay, and if you actually, if you go and look at details of the various companies that they provide, you know, broadband, 5G, TV, and all that stuff, be careful. If you measure carefully what bandwidth they give you, is not what is written in the contract. I don't want to say anything more because I have to be friends with everybody, okay? But there was a big issue a few years ago when people came and measured what is delivered versus what it was in the contract, and it wasn't there, which means the capacity is not infinite. It depends on how many demand it, okay? Yeah, you may want to speak through the thing, or maybe during the break we can discuss. Yeah. Uh, so, Professor Baras, I have a question about, uh, you talked about a reconfigurable intelligent surface, or RIS, right? Yeah. And I have seen some papers, RIS being very useful, even for the satellite, when you don't have line of sight. Yeah. Um, have you done we, any work? We have a little paper, which I didn't mention, where we actually use this kind of ideas to try to do beam forming for satellites is for Leos, okay, I can send it to you, but this is, needs to be a lot more study to try to do intelligence services on the satellites, okay? The key question is at what frequency you're gonna do it? Because the, these frequencies are 6G, they don't go very far. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have, to, you have to be careful. Right, right. A any other question, folks? Uh, let's uh, give uh, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, right, so this is a small token of appreciation for you. Thank uh, you very much. For coming and giving an excellent talk. Yeah. And um, we also small things. I tell you, now that I know the place exists, I mean, <laughs> instead of listening <laughs> to the, through the Zoom and the video. I, and I this is a small pen. And um, I, I much more enjoy You're also an IEEE fellow, so we got some IEEE talks as well. <laughs> thank, so, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm actually a life fellow, which means I'm very old. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know uh, some of your students have given talks here as well in the next meeting. Yeah, you have my first student. Still yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. He's, I was just chatting with him. <laughs> uh, he, got you his, he got his PhD in 81. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> That's my first PhD.